What's up, Zox fam? So I seen this video from Gotcha Smack on my timeline, and I actually wanted to see and hear what his opinion was about Weather and Waves. Uh, so this is going to be why Weather and Waves will flourish in the Gotcha space. So we're going to jump right into it. Um, we're going to give our input and uh, see what he has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to take the time to talk with you guys about why I think Weathering Waves is going to succeed, flourish, and blossom in the gotcha space. Um, I don't think it's going to be a Genshin killer, and I don't think it needs to be a Genshin killer. Yes, sir. Okay. Already started the video out right. <laughs> Already, already started the video out right, man. Listen, this is the energy that I feel like no matter what community and and I've been seeing this a lot that's been circulating. Like a lot of people are concerned with people coming into the community and creating some of the same or similar toxicities that they've seen in like Genshin Impact, um, you know, etc. I will say it is going to be really, really up to creators sitting on the top and even trickling down to make sure that we create a different narrative, right? Whenever we see or hear any of that nonsense, we are going to just completely shut it down because that's not the case. We really honestly, truly wanna see whether and ways be its own game. And like I said, I always agree with that exact statement, right? So we're gonna just, let's continue. It just needs to find a place for the game that they're trying to deliver. And that's what I wanna to talk to you guys about. Um, there's a number of reasons why I believe it's just gonna kill it. Mm. Uh, but let's first start off with reason number one. The Souls genre and Monster Hunter. Okay. This is a Wuthering Ways video, but I need you to understand this first. Um, Monster Hunter World is uh, Capcom's highest selling game of all time. Okay, that's and true. That's truly an incredible feat to achieve, be, uh, given you know the big titles that Capcom has. Uh, Resident Evil, uh, Street Fighter, uh, Marvel vs. Capcom, Devil May Cry. Uh, yeah. So many titles are under Capcom that are very successful IPs. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point, too, because when we're actually looking at like even like what Kiro has going on right now, they obviously have Punishing Grey Raven. And I think that that's this is going to be potentially one of those opportunities and like situations for them where they have an amazing game. Like if you guys have not had the chance to play Punishing Grey Raven, I think that you playing that and i'll probably actually stream some of this um on twitch.tv forward slash zoxiscon um make sure you guys come through okay i'm plugging myself in shamelessly now uh with that i'm going to probably stream some pgr at some point so you guys can actually see what the game is about especially in the current era that it's in it is absolutely insane what kind of graphic quality and combat quality the game has been able to put together but the thing is is that of course it's going to be a completely different thing with them being able to open up themselves to like what it seems like gotcha is talking about is kind of going more into that more like bigger like slightly still niche down like lane because like when you're talking about souls or monster hunter those games are pretty niched for the respective audience and i mean even true to like when they originally came out um that's just how it kind of was i, I definitely played a lot of soul games and monster Hunter. my god dude like <laughs> i feel like if you're at a certain age and you really like were one of those super technical gamers you probably played Monster Hunter, right? And, and again, it wasn't a whole lot of people, but you probably played it to some degree. Um, but Monster Hunter started off as a very niche video game. Yeah, like not 100%. Not a lot of about. Um, and the reason it is niche, as well as the Souls genre, is because the companies behind them that developed them understood the functionality of the game and who the audience it was intended to target. Yeah, yeah. Which is more so the hardcore gamer. And that's one thing I will say that I've, I've seen a lot of players mentioning as a concern is that uh, they don't know like how they're going to fare in a game that might be more catered to sweaty people and i feel like a lot of the times with these games they usually offer something they have some sort of mechanic to come into play to kind of offset that a little bit so i feel like also too it's like at some point there has to be a bone thrown at those more hardcore players um you know again i do get it like you can make more money if you make a game where it's just generally more appealing but i really do feel like there's something special that comes out of games that really make it rewarding when you finally can complete something for the first time than the casual gamer now casuals by default are a 10 to 1 ratio in terms of volume and uh, you know, sheer number of people. Yeah, that's that's true. Them to a hardcore gamer, 100%. Which is why a majority of companies today cater to the casual gamer. It's not rocket science. Way more numbers, you can <laughs> way more money. Way made, more money. Or at least yep. the potential to make <laughs> more money. But there are scenarios where you can have a hardcore audience targeted video game and make ridiculously uh, loads of money. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, one game that comes to mind is Lost Ark. 
<laughs> Lost Ark did not have a big uh, player base. But what it did have is a loyal, hardcore, sweaty gamer player base who spent tons of money yeah. on that pay to win MMO. Um, but getting back to the topic, <laughs> man, people spent Hunter hours on that game. Do one thing better than every other genre uh, out there in the gaming industry, and that is deliver exhilarating boss fights and combat. Uh, fights that make you hold your breath, fights that make you have to do mm. them repetitively. Uh, just to uh, you know, memorize the patterns, find the weaknesses and openings of the monster to deal uh, some damage. What I think they have figured out more than everyone else is they understand how crucial and paramount it is to get down the balancing aspect of combat. And the balancing variables mm. are going to be punishing yeah, that's true. versus rewarding. Yeah, I actually agree with this standpoint too. Like uh, the games, like especially games that are like this, usually, usually when it comes down to the reward versus like the punishment, usually you get punished a lot more like they are very 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 <laughs> very very pro to push that more and that's whether you're playing a souls or you're playing a game like monster hunter um but my god when you actually get the reward it's probably one of the most satisfying things because a lot of times if you land something it's like yo did i just land that and then it does like a crazy amount of damage or something like that like those are usually like some of the most uh, rewarding things i will say like considering like uh uh, I was playing uh, Elden Ring not too long ago. Elden Ring definitely, uh, like, again, I love like, just soul games in general. I would say one of my favorite ones is probably, like, Bloodborne, dude. Like, Bloodborne's, like, really insane. Um, but when we're talking about, like, Elden Ring, which is a little bit more newer, uh, they did have a lot of different things that was offered to allow players to be able to play that, even casually, which was kind of surprising compared to, like, Bloodborne, where I just felt like you got beat up 99% of the game. Game. so you know there's just kind of like things like that uh monster hunter and dark souls both have a higher punishing ratio than they have a rewarding yeah ratio, which exactly makes you appreciate the reward which is generally the combos that you want to do without the monster beating your ass, the, <laughs> the enemy beating your ass. yeah 100 um, so they have this down to a t but one thing i can say that souls genre does better than monster hunter is boss fights their boss fights are much more exhilarating intense and uh nail biting whereas monster hunter it just delivers it a notch under them but what it does i feel like i feel like um i feel like <laughs> I feel like the soul games are just more annoying. Like, I feel like Monster Hunter, you actually have like the the aspect of being able to time everything. Like there there really is like hard set in point um like interactions that the enemy gives for you to be able to time everything. I kind of like games that do things like that. That's what we were actually able to experience in the CBT1 with Weathering Waves. Um was things that were a little bit more catered to timing versus what I feel like what happens in Elden Ring a lot of the times is you have a lot of nuances or annoyances in like certain boss fights where the boss is like you think he's about to uppercut you and he somehow manages to come like with a downward like uh slam or something like it's like always something that's kind of mixed in and then there's always like some form of like there's like a weird it's always like a weird timing i don't know what exactly to call it but it's like it's like a weird timing that they kind of have put in place in the game that makes it much harder to be able to deliver those proper combos because you're so worried and kind of second guessing a lot of times i mean again on your skill level on when exactly the enemy is going to be hitting you you know so i feel like that can kind of vary and when we're talking about like pure difficulty i do feel like eldering or the soul games can be a lot harder just especially depending on how you play right and i think that could be also said with monster hunter depending on how you play that can also kind of scale how much more difficult the game is um and as well as like even weapons and classes that you might use the soul genre is it gives you a much more complex and mechanically intricate combat system with the characters I and look weapon at that, classes. Man. That so much utilizing. going on right now. I think Monster Hunter overall has a better combat experience than Souls. In my personal opinion, and I understand okay. the two audiences are strong by the genres that they love, but I think Monster Hunter has a more balanced combat system than the Souls genre does. Uh, yeah, I feel like I feel like I get what you're saying there. It's like Monster Hunter has a lot more variety 
for uh, the average player. Um, and I feel like that's like within their weapon systems, respectively. There's a lot of different choices that you can pick up because there's obviously classes that are harder than others. Um, but I guess with even like games like the Soul games or even Elder Ring, um, there's like difficulties within reason within each class. Um, and there's a lot of factors like, right, we're talking about weight, armor weight. Uh, I know these things are also things, too, uh, with Monster Hunter. But like, you know, these are just some of the things that kind of play a huge part in like, OK, how fast can you swing your sword? Uh, how fast can you jump? Um, there's even like the mobility, like people doing clears where they take all their gear off, <laughs> basically strip naked and they go sick. And it's like, well, you can move faster. You can do a lot more faster. But hey, man, you get hit. It's over for you. So I really think that a lot of that. Yeah, I 100 percent agree. Like, hey, like it's really going to boil it down to your preference there, because I feel like I personally really like um like the soul games more. Um, but I think it's just because I like the the intensity of them and um, just kind of like that dystopian feel that they kind of give. So I just really, really like those a lot more. I all this into Wuthering Waves here in a bit. I just need you guys to understand the psychology as well as, you know, why these these games succeed. Anyways, regardless of which game does what better, uh, one simple fact still remains. It's the fact that both of these uh, you know, genres, the, the hunting genre, mm. which was literally single handedly defined by Monster Hunter and the soul genre, they both aren't afraid to take the monumental risk of not catering to a casual. Yeah, that's now, huge. What they do yeah, that's do huge. Is they do put tools and resources in their games that a casual player can utilize to get through the fights and make the fights beatable. Yep. But they do not 100%. compromise the functionality of their game as well as the challenge of their game. They, they will not you know diminish the challenge of the boss fight nor will they diminish the complexity of the classes and what you're supposed to be doing in the game yeah but they will say things like for monster hunter for example here's a trap tool okay here's a flash pod uh here's multiplayer so you can play with other people but yeah that's literally what Elden ring did as well like they made it to where you can either go and you could farm like uh you can put power level and do all that and then come back and fight certain things or there was the multiplayer that was accessible um i remember playing like bloodborne for example um or even the first souls uh they're like again like when the first playthrough i wasn't playing with multiplayer you know like there was like even i think with bloodborne later on they went back and added multiplayer so like there was like things like that that for those initial playthroughs, um, you know, and uh, I would say from then till now, they've made a lot of changes to allow the average player to be able to consume the game and still find some sort of enjoyment, even if they're not really hitting the peak, uh, I would say set like, like, like the peak point of what the difficulty um, of those games are really offering. And I feel like that's something that could really be a really big deal if we're able to kind of see some of those things of uh, like, I would say unfold or go into or be pouring into uh, weather and waves. But they're not going to make the fights easier. They're not going to cater to the casual. They're gonna cater to the hardcore gamer. Mm. Doing this risks the, the failure of your game because you're already like, telling that audience to go play something else without having to say so. But generally, when you stay true to the functionality of your game, what happens is a refinement and a polish of that functionality becomes uh, incredibly vivid. Yeah. And over time, a good reputation builds up on you and what gamers can expect from you. And the casual ends up coming over to the game anyways, because everybody unanimous, unanimously praises that game now yeah that's what they say is like kind of like curiosity killed the cat <laughs> it's just it's kind of the same thing in a sense uh it minus the killing part but it's like you want to know right you want to see i think that's kind of what's happening right now it's a lot of good things being put out because curo honestly i will say is overall a very good company and so i feel like with that being the narrative that's being painted whether this game tends to be more on the technical side or not i think that that's going to be be a really solid reason for players to want to invest their time. I'm already getting comments on some of my videos, which again, shout out to you guys for like really watching and supporting the videos right now. But I've been getting a lot of comments from some of you guys. It's like, hey man, like if this is the kind of company that like if you guys are saying what this is, is the truth, I want to make sure that my resources, my time, my money is going into that. So honestly, I'm just going to be honest, like that's a really, really big point all in its own right, you know? When I come back to Weathering Waves, the first uh, variable, which was a very lengthy uh, discussion, I believe it's going to be successful, 
is because their predecessor, which is Punishing Grey Raven, mm -hmm. Kudo Games' previous title, which is still playable. Um, I've heard nobody say this game's combat sucks or this game's challenge, the boss fights. I've I've heard unanimous praise damn near about this yeah, game. Yeah, 100%. But nobody knows about it. Yep. And it had terrible exposure, and many people go around saying that it has... That, that they just didn't market the game well enough. Yes, 100% as a Punishing Grey Raven content creator at one point in my career, uh, that was 100% the truth. That That is the truth. They did a very bad job at the marketing of the game. Um, and I think that that's kind of something that we're hoping to see them do more of with Weather and Waves. I think that's why we're also seeing a lot more people saying Weather and Waves deserves this. They um, you know, should be making more money. We want to see them cook. We want to see them win. Because I think a lot of this is like, it feels like they look at their game like a passion project. It doesn't necessarily just feel like they're just looking at it as this next cash grab. It really does and has felt like that for quite some time that they really do care and cater to what we could, I guess, consider their niche or audience. Um, but it is done so successfully and so well that those players continue to play long term. And whenever any big thing comes back or comes up, like, for example, the uh, like the uh, alpha. Um, oh, my God, I forgot what the uh, Gen 2 alpha is called. But once she comes out, best and believe there's going to be a crazy spike in the player base just so people can actually experience the combat of this character and i think this all started with the most recent bianca that came out she was like the introduction to like the next generation of characters in that game and so i i just honestly believe that they have been able to upkeep and maintain a certain level of quality which through word of mouth word of mouth is very very powerful it has allowed them to be able to stay afloat and to some degree be relevant even if they're not the most relevant from punishing gray raven compared to some other games currently right regardless of what it may be one thing is for sure this game delivered on boss fights it delivered yeah that's alpha combat. right there and because of this everyone knows that their next game which is weathering waves is going to deliver on the same thing mm -hmm. the reputation has been built the entire community loves the game the only reason that pgr failed which you know, y'all can make the argument that it didn't, but to be honest with you, if it didn't capture the Western audience, then it failed. But it actually failed because nobody knew about the game. The game didn't get enough exposure. Okay, I would, I, and I will say the catch twenty two to that is that it might not have did as well on the Western side, but it did extremely well on the CN side, right? Um, I think that that's kind of like that dilemma. It's like it depends on what market you're in and whether or not the game succeeded or failed. Um, I don't think that the game necessarily failed because it didn't captivate, but I think that they basically came in and they were able to execute and cater to their niche audience, which didn't necessarily lead to a bigger blow up. I think because there was also a lot of things that were still in the works. Um, I think this is also a thing that you have to also consider when a game has another version that is a little bit older. Like for example, Global came out like what, a year or two almost after seeing, actually almost three, no, no, two. So I think they kind of closed the gap, I think a little bit um, to where the updates are, what, probably like a year apart, maybe somewhere around there. Because I know there's a, it's somewhere around there. I might be like kind of off a little bit, but I know that there's a lengthy time period in between um, when CN gets something versus when the global players get it in the West. Right. Um, so with that being the case, there was a lot of updates and changes and polishes that they already made to the CN that they at, at initially weren't releasing into uh, the global version. I know that they sped up a couple of different things, but that was definitely a huge factor into why things kind of were the way it was. Because for example, th this kind of ruins the, the player experience. And this is another reason why I'm glad Weather and Waves is coming out simultaneously is because when there's another server and you get to see what the game is supposed to be or could be, but you have to go through the predecessing things and experience it the way it was prior to, and then you have to wait for an update and then say it's like a year to that update. It it's a really painful thing. And then trying to convince players to play up until that point is it's it's just kind of a terrible axe at that point. So I don't think it was necessarily that they didn't have things changed or um, they just failed. I just think that it was just simply a matter of just the fact that um, one, the servers were just launched at separate times. And that a lot of the times causes uh, a, a lot of, um, I would say disconnect, right? Because people are looking at people on CN uh, when Global first came out parrying and countering and doing all that stuff and we got to sit here and play with like 
the <laughs> we gotta play with all the beginner characters and we're just over here suffering while we're watching them kind of go crazy with combos and stuff and having all the insane bosses so yeah it was it's definitely a, it was a workup i feel like with punishing gray raven 100 percent um and so yeah i, I would say that that's kind of just my take on that you will hear all kinds of people say those exact same words but people are now trying to uh, put that same standard on Weathering Waves. Oh, it doesn't get enough exposure. Kudo Games doesn't know how to market their game. Uh, after looking uh, at the development phases prior to Weathering Waves' release, after looking at the whole thing retroactively, mm. I can honestly say anything. Oh, retrospectively, this okay. It's just wrong, objectively. Uh, because everyone knows about Weathering Waves, which is not what That's happened true. with PGR. If you ask anybody in this gotcha space who really knows gotcha games, Everybody knows about Weathering Waves. Yeah, literally the only reason why Weathering Waves had dipped for the time period that they did was because they were changing 90% of the story. <laughs> like, they were fixing the game. That was them taking the information they got from their CBT. And even during that time period, they were quiet. They were running a CN NDA based uh, techni um, test, technical test, or uh, yeah, it was basically a, a closed beta test. So they were running that while we were sitting waiting and we're just kind of like, oh my God, when's this news coming? And and that's what led to a whole bunch of leaks and all that jazz that ended up on Twitter. But all in all, they were cooking the entire time. So I feel like with that, too, if they were really not as known, people wouldn't even have been going out of their way to really leak as much stuff. And it wouldn't have been causing all types of hashtags and all that craziness on Twitter, um, in my opinion. Every person is talking about Weathering Waves. Um, and the other thing is the big names in the space that stream and have a large audience, they know about Weathering Waves and they're gonna play it upon release. Yeah. I brought up Tower of Fantasy when I was streaming talking about this category because I wanted people to understand that when Tower of Fantasy released, it had over a million viewers in the Twitch category. That's true. A massive amount of viewers. And what I found fascinating about this is that when Tower of Fantasy released, it had the worst goddamn publicity uh, out of all the gotcha games, <laughs> nobody was talking about this game in a positive manner. Everyone was shitting on it because they ended up, you know, stealing some other IPs like yeah. animations, word for word. They have bad reputation. It had a horrible uh, reputation upon its release, and it had over a million viewers waiting to play the game. Yeah, I, that, a lot of that also came from the fact that TOF, when it dropped, it had so many bugs and issues, and like they just did not live up to the hype that they were trying to set right and then they also made this very fatal mistake in my opinion they actually started taking shots at genshin impact basically saying and insinuating at that point kind of riding that coattail hey we're going to definitely be the genshin killer so then to not deliver on that that's what hurt the game very very much so like that that uh, right there is one of the things that significantly hurt the game and if we're even looking at things as is right now you have not seen Kiro start switching her marketing tactics and start talking about oh we're about to be the next Genshin killer like that was like a legitimate thing that was like happening with TOF so it's kind of interesting like I said to just see how Kiro is handling this situation a lot different I just feel like they just need to continue to do what they're doing keep their heads low and to continue to produce an amazing project and I honestly feel like like they're going to be fine to be honest because it was marketed as the genshin killer and people by nature still want to try the next gotcha game that could be a good gotcha game yeah i bring this up because i think weathering waves has the to the contrary has amazing reputation and everyone's saying nothing but good stuff about this company they're saying they deserve more deserve praise more absolutely attention. so when it releases i think it's going to have an even bigger release than what tower of fantasy had and it's actually going to deliver on what people were expecting it to deliver on, which is exhilarating mm. boss fights, challenge and good combat. And that's the focus of what Weathering Waves is. And I actually think they're willing to take the same risks that Souls games and Monster Hunter uh, does. Yeah, I agree with that. I 100 percent agree with that. I do think that Kiro is uh, an expert at what they do. Um, I do believe that that is one of the things that has led them to have a very strong and solidified fan base. Um, and I would even say, like, for argument's sake, like, this is something that hasn't just happened once before. You guys have to remember that Gen um, Hoyo has another game called Honkai Impact. And when Honkai Impact wasn't meeting certain players' expectations, you know what game they went to? 
punishing Greg Raven, you know? So that was kind of another situation. So they've had prior prior or previous dealings when it's come down to their games um, with Hoyoverse before. So this isn't the first rodeo that I think that Kiro has had. And I think they also have witnessed what happened to like games like TOF. And it just seems like they're just taking the uh, much smarter approach, which is letting Genshin do whatever it's going to do to itself, right? Like I think that that respectively is one of the best takes that you can have as a company is to continue to do your own thing and deliver right don't go and it kind of goes into like those people that like for example they're always super rowdy um and you know always trying to start stuff with people but when it's really time to get into it they're they're scared and they don't want to hide behind people and then it's always the really quiet ones that's like hey man leave me alone and then they sucker punch you and hit you with a haruken you know and then you're just wondering like yo where'd that come from it's always the quiet ones right <laughs> so i just believe if they keep that quiet one energy we're going to be eating, man, like 100%. Which is not cater to the casual and cater to the sweaty gamer. And what this is going to do is it's not going to kill Genshin. It's just going to allow them to find a space in the genre where they are doing something that is uniquely exclusive mm. to their game, yep. which is deliver a challenge and deliver boss fights. What makes Souls games and Monster Hunter games attractive is no one cares about the goddamn story. They care about the fight and the bosses. Yeah, that's all. The, that's the core component of those games. And I mentioned this before as well on stream. I said that the story in Monster Hunter is dog water. Nobody plays a Monster Hunter game for the story. Yeah. The story in Elden Ring is damn good, top of the line story, but it's only for big brain 5 billion IQ people who pay attention. Let's be honest, the majority of people that, mm. that play Elden Ring, they don't know what the is going on. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I'm not gonna lie. I played through Elden Ring and I did not keep up with any of the context of the story. I will say though, at least in the gotcha space, that's where things kind of differ a little bit. Um, I would at least say, like being a pretty relevant creator, um, you know, playing games like Ark Knights or uh, even playing games like Punishing Great Raven people love their lore, right? Honkai Star Rail, these games, like people in the gacha space love lore, right? And, and so that's like one thing I think is gonna be very different here is that there's a reason why the team went and rewrote 90% of the story. Um, if players, they felt like weren't gonna really pay attention or really care as much, they probably would've just left it as is because it wasn't necessarily as bad to those uh, average players, right? They wouldn't have realized or have noticed it in the first place. But to all the feedback that they got, there was people that actually really were paying attention to the story element and aspects of the game and, and the continuity and the um, the emotion and the just characteristics of characters. How does it tie in? Why are they relevant? Why do I want to like this character? I feel like, again, it's one of those things that has kind of come from what they've asserted and have set up in their predecessing game punishing gray raven where the story is a very a very important aspect of why you're even using or why a certain character is even relevant or coming into the game where did this character come from there's story that's attached to that character that plays a huge part into even the event structure that they have so I think that that's definitely going to be one of those things where, again, I had to ask myself and have this realization um, earlier this year on my other channel that there's going to be players that are playing for story. There's going to be players that are playing for gameplay. Um, and there's going to be uh, players that are just playing because they just want to have fun with their friends, right? There's going to be a whole bunch of different reasons as to why people are picking up this game. But it is going to be very important that, uh, again, Kiro continues to make something that's well-rounded, that can cater to multiple different audience with audiences without straying away from the core thing that they're really good at or they're professional at and they're not playing the game for that they're playing it for what i just told you so i've heard people say that if weathering waves doesn't have a good story it's going to die and i couldn't disagree more because you are trying to compare to uh mm -hmm. weathering waves to what genshin did to succeed which that's a whole nother argument in and of itself yeah i don't know i don't agree with that either i don't think they're gonna story. die like from Monster not Hunter having Souls a good games. story a good story it needs good boss fights that are going to be uniquely exclusive uh and and they need to come in abundance each boss fight needs to leave a memory in your head where you want to go back to it and fight it that again unique and yep. exclusive experience 100 percent i agree unique identity to them uh that's why monster hunter and souls games are also so fun you could walk yourself through boss fights of each genre and be like oh my god that fight's fun i want to go back and do that fight yep. again weathering waves needs to do that and focus on that and they will because they already have the reputation for mm -hmm. it when i 100%. think about monster yeah. hunter i think got gotcha, you talking that talk bro uh, <laughs> uh, 
about Latreon. <laughs> I think about Nergi Gante, uh, Velkana. I think about, uh, hell, who else comes to my head? Uh, Kushala Deora, Teostra, you mm, name them. Yeah. All these fights have patterns. Uh, music and intensities that separate them from the other fights. You know, we go into Monster Hunter Rise, um, Gormagala and Magnamalo are some of the coolest fights. Yep. Valstrax and um, hell, I'm, I'm just, I'm just showing up my, my Monster Hunter knowledge at this point. <laughs> and when you go into Elden Ring and all the other Souls games, you can think of the fights as well. I think Wuthering Waves is actually going to deliver a similar experience to them where every fight is just as exhilarating. Yeah, and, uh, I defining. agree. Yeah, and I think I think that that's going to be the biggest thing. Like even right now, guys, like 100 percent. One of my one of my like, I think, top videos for Wuthering Waves right now is the gameplay. Right. Um, I did something where I created like I called it the boys, but I made like the rowdy rough boys with the color schemes of Mortify, Gian, and uh, I forgot what his name is, uh, but he has the top hat and the glasses and he's like blue in a suit. Um, I use them as like kind of to create this fighting like kind of like uh, like video. Right. And it was like insane. I love that video. The combat was so fun. And this was from CBT one, mind you, which had some issues. Right. But it was still fun nonetheless. And it created for me me and memory right because it was like one of those things where i'm like oh shoot like the character can get a parry this way you know i'm finding things out as i'm playing and it's like that experience is what really for me draws me into the game and i will say that that's not going to be the case for everyone but i think that that's kind of the thing that kiro is really good at is playing into creating strong memories for you to want to always come back so it doesn't matter how long i don't play punish and great raven for example Anytime somebody's like, hey, man, can we see you play Punishing Grey Raven? Can you show us Punishing Grey Raven? I will log into that game in a heartbeat. Because why? When I am playing it, I'm actually having fun. It is a memory. Oh, let me go try this boss. I remember this boss. Oh, my God. Like, I really want to show you guys this boss. Like, that's what happens every single time I get on that game. So if you could create something like that, you're going to also have people always coming back, too. So that's another really valid point as well. Nobody else in the gotcha genre is doing this. Everyone else is doing the greed move that a lot of gotcha games yep. do, and they're catering to a casual. And the best example of this is Genshin Impact. Yep. They will always cater to the casual. Why? Because that's where, that's most where the money of the is. Money is yep. And the easiest way to make the money, which leads me to my next DMC, my boy. Waves. They will not succeed if they over cater to the casual. They have to understand that the same thing that made Monster Hunter and Soul successful, they have to follow that same structure and protocol. You will not cater to the casual, but what you will do is use a, is, is provide tools and resources inside of your game that the casual can utilize to make the game beatable yeah. while not compromising that functionality of it. Um, if they do this, I think there's no reason that they won't succeed. Yeah, 100%. They don't need the large abundant audience of Hoyoverse. They don't need yeah, the hundred percent audience of the casual. hundred percent. I feel like this is the other thing too, guys, right? I, I want you guys to know, like if you're on my channel and you're watching my stuff, my intent is to never like trash a Genshin player, right? Um, and I want to be very clear on that because I feel like a lot of people come to these videos or they'll watch these kinds of videos and they think that if somebody is talking about another game, it's because they have this vendetta against the players. It's never been about the players. I could at least say for like the most I've seen, it's never about the players. It's about the companies. It, 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 that's the biggest thing. And for me, I'm trying to make sure that as a voice that has at least some sort of influence, I want those that watch my content to understand that, no, we're not looking at the players because I want you as a Genshin Impact player to also enjoy Weathering Waves. But I also want Weathering Waves to help your other game to say, hey, this is the standard. You should be treating your players like this so that you can equally enjoy both of the games. I don't think there's an issue with being able to enjoy another good game. I think that that's kind of the mentality that we even see in the YouTuber space. People just believe that I need to just be the solo creator. I don't need to interact with anyone because they're going to take my audience. And that's just not how it works. It's the same thing applies to these games. You literally are going to be in a position where, um, you know, if you like one game, you're going to play it. If you like another game, you're just going to find more time or other time to play that game. It's not going to be like one of those things where you just don't play it. Even if you don't necessarily play the other one as much, it's it's still going to be something that you might still play, right? Um, so I don't want you guys to ever feel like it's going to be a matter of, oh, Genshin players. No, it's about Hoyo, 
right? It's about upholding a better standard. And that is what is a lot of what we're hyped about is what Weather and Waves is presenting, you know? So I, I just feel like it, 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 it can't get more simpler than that. They just need a tenth of that audience. So if they have 10 million players, Kudos should only need 1 million players. And if they have the 1 million players, they will blossom and flourish. Yeah, they're going to 100% have million million way more than sweaty, that. Sweaty hardcore gamers. When you give them something that is worth their time, they will definitely Spend reward money. you and stick around yep. for a very long time. And with all of that being said, the last thing I want to talk to you about is what else do they need to do to be successful? Well, I think they just need to capitalize on all the little things that people convince themselves are big things. Mm, uh, graphics okay. of the game yep. character design drip of the character that's true uh, the things that make the gacha genre what the gacha genre is i also think they need to capitalize on music and boss fights music is one of the most underrated variables to making a good boss fight 100 percent. but apart from that exploration right getting creative and finding ingenuity with your world design um and then the story i, I genuinely think it's the same concept as the souls and hunting genre you don't need a good story you need good cut scenes anime weeby edgy <laughs> yeah show off some fine ass anime bitches show off some badass <laughs> anime dudes doing these super okay. flashy moves and shum post steps you do that and that that replaces a story for a lot of people they just yeah. automatically convince themselves in their brain like these 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 stimulations just pop off and they start convincing themselves that the story is good just because they saw a flashy cutscene. yeah <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, that's all it takes. Yo, did you see that cinematic, bro? Like, honestly, that's like one of the big things too. I think that um, we already have been kind of hitting at, um, and that they've already received us feedback. That's why we've seen such amazing graphical changes to the game, environment changes, all this jazz, because those are important things, right? And I think that that's the thing that like Weather and Waves is already playing into. I'm really, really excited though because I do feel like again. Um, you know, they're somehow going to be able to put themselves in a unique position because they're not only going to be just captivating uh, mobile gamers, right, or gotcha players, but this is now going to be going over into PC, going into potentially console. So now we're talking about a whole different ball game, guys. This is a completely different thing when we're just talking about mobile games, right? You can bring in a crazy amount of gamers on just mobile, but now we're expanding it to console accessibility, PC accessibility, that's going to be a whole different game. A whole different game now. <laughs> it happens to the anime community all the time. But I think if they do all of these things that I just mentioned, while also offering a variety of weapon classes and play styles, mm. uh, they'll, they'll do just fine and they're going to succeed. Uh, I look forward to this game's release. And I look forward to coming back to this video. I love making videos like this because if I end up being wrong, it's more content for me. I don't give a damn if I'm wrong or right. I'll just yeah. come back like, hey, shit, well, we missed. What you want me to do? But I shot that motherfucker, you know what I mean? Uh, comment down below. Let me know your thoughts, guys. Yeah, you. hey, I'm not going to lie. That's how, that's how I'm probably going to be looking at a lot of my videos. I'm like, dang. Like, like if the 1% the chance that Kiro somehow flops, I'll be like, dang. I was over here praising them a lot. No, but honestly, though, guys, on a serious note, definitely make sure you guys check out Gotcha Smack. Um, that's a really, really well done video. I actually really liked a lot of what he brought to the table as far as what, um, you know, he feels like is going to help or be a contributing factor into making uh, Weather and Way successful. I think that this is a very, 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 very valid point, a really, really important conversation to keep circulating. Uh, again, guys, let me know what you guys think about this, because I do feel like, again, um, um, there are a lot of variances in our opinions, but no matter what, uh, we got to just all come together and band together. And I feel like as long as we stick together and we try to find some sense of enjoyment with the game and what the company is presenting um, and the company continues to listen to its fans, I honestly think that Weather and Waves has the sky as the limit at this point. So, yeah, guys, that's going to be that.